choose an afternoon, a midwinter's afternoon, the pale sinking sun. And let it be anywhere in England. The ragged hedges and bare trees are rhymed with white frost. Water is glass, earth is stone, breath is cloud. The night begins to tighten its hold. To one side of the drive, there's always a, a low yew hedge, and beyond it, a walled kitchen garden. To the other side. <laughs> Well, I think it's a very different journey from the eye to the mind as from the ear to the mind. When you hear a story, it's on the edge of music. The cadence, the pitch and the colour of the word affect you in a very different way. Um, and I've always been interested in what language does, what spoken language does, the evocatory and invocatory qualities of language. What sort of stories do you like? Stories. 
gory? Yeah. Right. No. Yes. Have yes. you got strong stomachs? Yes. 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 But my story takes place one day in the middle of winter, and it was very, very, very cold. And this piper was making a journey from one town to another town. And there he was, and he was walking, and the wind was cutting through him like a knife. One of those lazy winds that goes through you and not round you. And as he was walking, all of a sudden, he, he tripped over something that was lying across the road underneath the snow. What use has a dead man for a beautiful pair of boots like those? First he sawed off one foot, and then <laughs> he sawed off the other foot. And then he tied the ends of the laces together and he slung the two boots around his neck oh. with the ankles jutting out of the tops of the boots. Teachers are constantly telling me that children have shorter and shorter attention spans and are constantly being amazed that they can sit for an hour and listen to an elaborate story. It's something that, I think it's innate. It's something that everybody enjoys. And um, I haven't found children's attention spans changing at all in the 25 years I've been working with them. Time went by, more fabric arrived, more bolts of material, and the tailor sat in his window, sewing away. But as is the way of- He lived in the sun. And he had two sisters, two goddesses. And people asking me to do things. And say, but you know, it could always be worse. The mother heard the song and was really panicking. Oh no, I can't let her in. But anyway. He Five hundred thousand Indians Although my song is rather full To me you may excuse I left my peaceful voidness And a fallen land to see And I bid farewell to Donegal Goodbye to Glen Swilly. It's very much a traveller idea that when you're telling a story behind you is everyone who's ever told the story before you. This line of people immediately behind you is the person you heard it from and behind him is the person he heard it from, and behind her is the person she heard it from. And I've always loved that idea. You begin to ask yourself, well, what's mine? What's, what's from my culture? I became aware of this embarrassment about all things English because of our history, because of empire, and um, the way that uh, the English have colonized so many other cultures. Um, I think there's a kind of national sense of unease about what's ours. It's become kind of politically incorrect almost to be, to admit to Englishness.
And as I looked at the dates again, I realised that they corresponded with the dates of one of my heroes, John Clare, who was born in the 1790s and died in the 1860s. And I started thinking, what was happening in his time that we're feeling the implication of now? In Milton Hall, in the great library, and Mr Char... The thing I've learned from working with you is the power of narrative. If you've got something to say and if you think somebody else might be interested in it, easily the best way to get it across to them is with a story. Uh, you can say almost anything you want to say. It can be quite difficult, it can be quite contentious, it can be outrageous. You can tell stories about the Spice Road and some of the great Indian epics and you can tell Aboriginal stories. He can tell all those stories. But I think what Hugh does is Hugh realises that ultimately the only story you can tell is your own. And so Hugh has really focused on, you know, England. Thank you very much. I did not grow wise by spending golden coin. And besides, I'll be staying here now. What I'm going to be doing over the day is sort of a, a storytelling workshop, but with particular kind of reference to story and landscape. If you know the stories of a place, I think the relationship with land shifts as well. It ceases to be a commodity. So I'd like to start off um, this morning by looking at our own personal relationships with place, our own history and the way it um, connects with place. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to make a map of your childhood home. If there's a particular place where you grew up or a particular place that you have a strong memory of when you were a child. Behind the storyteller's line of voices stretching back. So, you know, you are, you're telling of things that happened in the past. But, at the same time, the audience in front of you are here and now. And the story's only worth telling if it actually connects with the people who are there in front of you. It's no good as a bit of nostalgia or kind of baleful longing for a, 
for a lost world. It's only worth its salt if it's actually doing something now in the moment that's being told. And that tension between ancient things and the moment is at the heart of storytelling. There was a peddler called John Chapman. He was very, very poor, and he lived on the edge of the town of Swatham in an old house half open to the weather. But at the back of the house, there was a garden with an apple tree. And one night he had a dream, and in the dream he heard a voice, go to London Bridge. And so he journeyed to London Bridge, and he crossed the bridge backwards and forwards, and nothing happened. He sat down, shivering with the cold, and a shopkeeper came out and said, Stranger, what are you doing here? And John Chapman said, I had a dream. And in my dream, I heard a voice, and the voice said, Go to London Bridge. The shopkeeper said, Dreams. You don't want to take any notice of dreams. Last night, I had a ridiculous dream. I dreamed of a place called Swatham, and an old house half open to the weather, and an apple tree. And there I was, digging among the roots of the tree and the blade of the spade scraped against the lid of a chest. And when I lifted the lid, it was full of gold. Well, John Chapman ran back to Swapham. He fetched a spade, he dug, and sure enough, there was a chest full of sparkling yellow Roman gold. And with that gold, John Chapman paid for the building of a beautiful church, Swapham Church. And when he died, a statue was built of John Chapman, and at the foot of the statue, these words, even dreams can turn to gold.